Hey guys, welcome back to Med School Moose. This is going to be Comlex Level 3 High Yield Facts Part 4. Before we get started, same two disclaimers as always. Number one, this information is primarily for Comlex Level 3. That being said, there is a lot of information in here that is also high yield for USMLE Step 3, but primarily from Comlex Level 3 resources. Uh, and the second disclaimer is that this is from the resources that I use to study and my information. If you are seeing different information on your resources, I would just go with that. There are a lot of varying opinions in terms of treatments and those kinds of things out there. So just go with what your resources are saying if you are seeing something different. Let's go ahead and get started. First one here, patients with renal failure have what type of anemia? This is going to be a normocytic, normochromic anemia. Gave us some nice Easter kind of colors, spring colors for the Easter weekend here where I'm recording this. Let's move on. Synovial fluid findings in septic arthritis. This is something that's high yield for the exam and also just kind of high yield for clinical practice as well. You're going to see a leukocyte count of greater than 50,000 cells per microliter as well as a neutrophil predominance. That being said, you can certainly have a septic arthritis with a leukocyte count less than 50,000 cells, but that's kind of the magic number that's used on the exams as, as well as for a regular diagnosis. What is the most common site for co coarctation of the aorta? This is going to be just distal to the left subclavian artery. It can occur even further down than that, but the most common site is just distal to that left subclavian artery coming off of the aorta. What condition uh, is commonly associated with vitiligo? This is going to be Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Remember vitiligo, it is, is an autoimmune deficiency uh, and Hashimoto's thyroiditis is also an autoimmune disorder. So there can be an association there that you may see on exams. A common complication of hip dislocations is sciatic nerve injury. The sciatic nerve, of course, runs in close proximity to that hip joint, so if there is a dislocation, it can cause compression uh, and damage of the sciatic nerve, which can cause paresthesias of the affected limb. Moving on now, the anterior Chapman's point for the prostate. This stuff is very, very, very high yield. I cannot emphasize that enough. The viscerosomatic reflexes and the Chapman's points are very high yield. You need to have these down point. This is easy points on test day. Um, so the anterior Chapman's point for the prostate is going to the posterior lateral margin of the IT band. So basically kind of the thigh, <laughs> essentially, um, but they won't call it that. It'll be the lateral aspect of the IT band and just a little bit posterior to that. So if someone has some tissue texture changes or tenderness to palpation there, you want to be thinking about prostate pathology. Treatment of choice for diphtheria. This is going to be penicillin or erythromycin antitoxin. We don't commonly see diphtheria nowadays because of vaccination, but if there is a patient who is an immigrant or a refugee or just a child who is not vaccinated and they present with this, the treatment is going to be penicillin or erythromycin plus antitoxin. Moving on now, what type of biopsy is used to diagnose melanoma? For some reason, I always had a hard time remembering this when I was studying, but it is an excisional biopsy. I would always pick punch biopsy, I don't know why, but diagnosis of melanoma is done with an excisional biopsy. Electrolyte findings associated with Kahn syndrome. So let's think through this one for a minute. Kahn syndrome is a primary hyperaldosteronism, so you're having over-secretion of aldosterone. What's the purpose of aldosterone? It is a mineralocorticoid that reabsorbs uh, sodium and excretes potassium. So if we have too much hyperaldosterone in, we're going to get uh, increased reabsorption of sodium and increased excretion of potassium. That's going to give us a hypernatremia and a hypokalemia. Very high yield to know the physiology there. First line treatment for polycythemia vera. This is going to be hydroxyurea. Just a side note here, I think I've discussed this on previous videos, but uh, for a patient with polycythemia vera in the vignette, they may give you something like the patient feels very itchy after being in a warm, crowded place or after taking a shower. After taking a shower. Um, if you see that, you want to be thinking polycythemia vera. How are we treating it? Hydroxyurea. Treatment of choice for pemphigus vulgaris. This is also another autoimmune condition, so we are going to use systemic corticosteroids here. Congenital toxoplasmosis triad is going to be hydrocephalus, chorioretinitis, and intracranial calcifications. Very high yield to know that imagery there as well. 
If they give you a CAT scan of the brain and you see a couple uh, rim enhancing lesions in multiple areas, you want to be thinking about congenital toxoplasmosis. What is the prophylaxis for an infant born to an HIV positive mother? This kind of falls along the lines of that primary care stuff that they really love on Comlex. So um, you have a baby, mom is HIV positive, what are you going to do? It's going to be Zidavudine for baby for six weeks. What condition almost always spares the lungs? I know this question is a little bit vague and I apologize for that, but I do want to just drive this point home. Uh, there aren't a lot of absolutes in medicine and this is not an absolute, but it's pretty darn close. Polyarteritis nod nodosa always spares the lungs. Conjunctivitis within the first 24 hours of life is blank until proven otherwise. It is chemical. So if you have a neonate and they have conjunctival findings, you want to be thinking chemical conjunctivitis. Gonorrheal and chlamydial conjunctivitis typically present later than the first 24 hours of life. What microbe commonly can live in and cause infection in the cecum and appendix? This is going to be Enterobius vermicularis. This is that pinworm. Uh, really important point here. This is an, a mimic of appendicitis. So if you have a patient come in who recently traveled and they're having fever and right lower quadrant pain, you should be thinking appendicitis, but do not forget to also be thinking about an infection with Enterobius vermicularis because it can hang out in that appendix. Anterior Chapman's point for the gallbladder. Like I said, this stuff is high yield. You just need to know it. In this case, it's going to be the sixth intercostal space on the right, which is about where the gallbladder is. Quick side note here, frequently on the exam when they ask questions like this, they're not going to give you fifth and sixth and seventh intercostal spaces as options. Um, they usually make it a little bit easier than that because like I said before, in resources, this information can vary. So anterior Chapman's point for the gallbladder is going to be the sixth intercostal space on the right. Which osteopathic technique attempts to achieve a still point? This is going to be CV4. This is that uh, technique with the hands on the head and you're doing compression of the fourth ventricle. I have seen this, quest this question asked verbatim just like this. Which osteopathic technique attempts to achieve a still point? And the answer is CV4. Another triad here, it's going to be the Wiscott-Aldrich syndrome triad. This is going to be thrombocytopenia, eczema, and immunodeficiency. What is the most common cardiac abnormality in Turner syndrome? Do not get trapped here. The answer is bicuspid aortic valve. I know in a lot of resources, the association with Turner syndrome is uh, coarctation of the aorta. However, the most common one is bicuspid aortic valve. I believe bicuspid aortic valve occurs in about 16% of patients with Turner syndrome and coarctation of the aorta occurs in about 11%. So you got to know that this one is actually more common here. What is the most common anatomic presentation of an anterior shoulder dislocation? So how are they going to be describing that shoulder to you when it's just dislocated? The arm is going to be abducted and extended. That is how they are going to describe an anterior shoulder dislocation. Which type of bilirubin can cross the blood-brain barrier? This is going to be indirect or unconjugated bilirubin. This is why you, when you have patients with an elevated indirect or unconjugated bilirubin, they can present with kernicterus or altered mental status because this type of bilirubin can cross the blood-brain barrier and cause problems. A lot of tongue twisters today, blood-brain barrier. Let's try to say that five times fast. Anyways, patients diagnosed with a pulmonary embolism for the first time should be anticoagulated for blank with blank. So how long should they be anticoagulated for and what medication should be used? The answer in this case is going to be three to six months with warfarin. That being said, there are a lot of differing opinions out there. You can get heparin and Lovenox and bridging and all that involved. But for purposes of the exam, what I have seen, first time PE, you want to anticoagulate for three to six months with warfarin. Another one, anterior Chapman's point for the thyroid gland. This is going to be the second intercostal space. You got to know these guys. Why is hydrocortisone the treatment of choice for primary adrenal insufficiency? This is some high yield physiology here as well. And the reason is that hydrocortisone has both mineralocorticoid and glucocorticoid activity. We're talking about primary adrenal insufficiency. This is a failure of the adrenal gland itself. So it is not producing the hormones that it needs to be. 
The reason you want to treat that with hydrocortisone is because it has all of the activity of the steroids that the adrenal glands would normally be producing, and that is how you can kind of compensate for that deficiency. Congenital adrenal hyperplasia is most commonly caused by blank deficiency and results in elevated blank. This stuff is very high yield as well, most commonly caused by a 21 hydroxylase deficiency and results in elevated 17 hydroxy progesterone. Uh, this pathway with all the different production still haunts my nightmares, but this is something you need to know. Most common cause of congenital adrenal hyperplasia is a deficiency in 21 hydroxylase. And the step even beyond that, what becomes elevated is going to be 17 hydroxy progesterone. Rocker bottom feet is associated with Patau syndrome. Remember, this is a trisomy 13. They may just say rocker bottom feet, or they may give you a picture. You want to make that association really easy points there, Patau syndrome. The next one right after that, clenched fists is associated with Edward syndrome. This is going to be a trisomy 18. Very common for them to give you a vignette, and they kind of describe some findings on baby, findings on the neonate. If you see rocker bottom feet, Patau syndrome. If you see clenched fists, you want to be thinking Edward syndrome. Blank is the most useful lab value to monitor heparin therapy. This is going to be PTT. If you are on rotations or you're a resident working in the hospital, this is probably one that you know that you have to check the PTT a couple hours after starting heparin drips, uh, and that's high yield for the exam as well. What is the most common familial hyperlipoproteinemia? Does anybody even remember this one from their step one studying uh, or complex level one studying? Probably not, but the most common familial hyperlipoproteinemia is going to be type 2a. Just try to remember that. Stick that in the back of your brain as best as you can. That is the last question. One more thing, just some big news that I have coming up. I am currently in the process of making a Med School Moose website. All of my high yield videos will be on there, but I also want to add some resources and information for pre-medical students and medical students about how to be successful in medical school and throughout their medical education career. This is something that is important to me that I've wanted to do for quite a while. The high yield videos have become quite popular, but I do still want to put these resources out there because I think, I hope there are some people out there who can benefit from it. So Med School Moose website, hopefully coming soon. Uh, as always, guys, thank you so much for watching. Please like, comment, subscribe on my videos. If you have suggestions for how I can get better or suggestions for future videos, please leave me a comment. And thank you so much for watching. Good luck with your studying.